So I'm a pediatric radiologist and the CEO of Envision a Deep AI. I have 20 years of experience working in public hospitals and I've also participated in outreach efforts um, throughout Africa. I think as Africans, and specifically as South Africans, we know our problems more than anyone, right? And we can provide solutions to these problems. So funding would be required in order for us to be able to build more solutions um, and collaborating with other countries would be mutually beneficial. I am so proud to be a South African. We are so diverse. We have the talent. We have the perseverance. We have the tenacity. And most of all, as South Africans, we have the resilience. The global uh, COVID-19 pandemic has raised many issues, and we've also seen Mr. Masiwa raise those issues around vaccine inequality and equity, access to certain places and spaces, and how has South Africa reacted to that? Leanne Manas is a face that South Africans have woken up to in the last decade and a morning live presenter on SABC News. She'll be moderating a discussion with Dr. Ryan Norch, who's the CEO of Discovery Health. Dr. Stavros Nikola, who's the senior executive at Aspen Pharmacare Group, will be dialing in. Ms. Malibone Precious Masoto, who's the former DG of Health, and Ms. Gloria Sorobe, who's the chairman of the Solidarity Fund, will also be dialing in. If I can ask the panelists who are here to make their way onto stage so we can continue this discussion around health. Remember, if you're watching us online on Facebook or YouTube, you can use the hashtag NBF21 or leave your comments. In the comment section, we'll pose that to the panelists' time dependent, and do continue interacting with us on Twitter, Facebook, and our other social media platforms. All right, I think, uh, I think we've got Gloria and Stavros online. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, come on. Not everyone is online. There are some live beating hearts inside this room. It's so nice to be with you. How has everything been so far? Good. Yeah, it has been great. I'll tell you why. I've been watching online, so I just thought I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quickly log in, have a look and see what things were like, and then... I, I suddenly got hooked, so I landed up watching it all the way while I was getting ready. Then I put it on in the car, I was listening to it online, and I was listening to Simon. I arrived here and then carried on listening in the room and, and, and really, really enjoyed Strive as well. So I hope that we can keep this panel up to that standard, but I've got a feeling we're going to. We're going to do exceptionally well because the guests that we've got, a part of this panel, are absolutely incredible. And to get them all... He, well, almost here, because we know how business it works, and Stavros cannot leave that office right now. Stavros, I've only ever seen you sitting in that chair. I'm, I'm no. worrying about you. Are you getting out? Because we know how much responsibility is on your plate. How are you doing this afternoon? Leanne, firstly, thanks very much for, for having me. And it's, no, it's, I'm it's, in sad that, uh, it's sad that we have to rely on virtual platforms to see old friends. <laughs> Uh, like yourself, and uh, you know that I've been interacting with Gloria over the last 18 months, but we haven't seen each other in person. Yeah. Uh, she even has a granddaughter that is my neighbor, and yet we're not able to meet. So I guess we're all shouldered to the wheel, all for a good cause, Leanne. Will you, will you confirm uh, yeah. that we we'll get We'll get Gloria to get herself on mute. You know, we still, we still struggle with these mute issues. We really do. But, I mean, this is, this is the reality of the life that we're leading now. And, you know, Stavros, I know that you're under time constraints as well. And I'm going to start off by throwing a question at you because um, I, th I think we've got you until just uh, around about 20 past two, somewhere there. So let me start picking your brain up front. This has been 
a very, very difficult time for, for the world. And then, of course, South Africa fits into the bigger picture of all of this. And it has been about vaccines. Um, it was the, 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 the procuring of vaccines. It's now the manufacturing of the vaccines, the patents all around it, the distribution of all of it. The, I mean, the, now it's the hesitancy that we're worrying about. I mean, there's just there's constantly a new hurdle in the way of what we're going through right now. But from your perspective, sitting at Aspen, sitting at the heart of it all, let's talk to what you think that South Africa's biggest lesson has been out of this. Leanne, f firstly, let me say as difficult a period as it's been, I actually see some silver linings. And, and I'll unpack those in a minute once I've responded directly to your question. So wh what is the single biggest learning it is undoubtedly that you cannot depend on the rest of the world. You have to have your own local capacities. Uh, I, I hadn't uh, had the opportunity to listen to Strive Mr. You I speak earlier, but I, I can only imagine, because I speak to him virtually on a daily basis, I can only imagine that he reinforced this point. Uh, vaccine inequality, the unevenness of the distribution, uh, yet again has exposed significant fault lines and the only way to solve for these fault lines is you have to develop your own local capacities. And, and I'm proud to say, and this, let me get onto the silver linings now in the end. Uh, and I'm not for one minute being insensitive to the public health crisis we've all experienced, the difficulties, the loss of loved ones. But I, I think South Africa has made us proud during this period. It's made us proud because some of, the, some of the finest scientists reside here in our very own country. I'm talking about people like Professor Glenda Gray, uh, Linda Galbecker, Francois Fenter, Tulio de Oliveira. These are all world leaders. And it's not by accident that South Africa has been the site for many of the most prominent COVID vaccine clinical trials. It's not by accident. So let, let's uh, firstly commend our scientific community. And then secondly, uh, to bring it a little closer to home um, and this issue around building and having your own capacities to deal with your own problems uh, on the continent. Uh, Aspen was one of 11 contract manufacturers that Johnson & Johnson, which is one of the two uh, vaccine options we have in our country and largely on the continent. We were one of 11 contract manufacturers that were signed by Johnson & Johnson to produce uh, what we call fill and finish, the, the Johnson & Johnson COVID vaccine, which has a, a number of distinct advantages vis-a-vis -vis the other vaccine options. And I'm proud to tell you that although we were the ninth of the 11th that were engaged by Johnson & Johnson, we actually came on stream first. Oh. So we leapt from eight others ahead of us, and we are also right now, uh, and Johnson & Johnson described Aspen as the crown jewel in their contract manufacturing arrangements. We are now the contract manufacturer that is producing the most Johnson & Johnson vaccines in the world Amazing. as we sit here right now. So in conclusion, those are the silver linings, our scientific and medical press on the one hand, and then secondly, how a local manufacturer, the only one in the Southern Hemisphere and on the African continent, Aspen, has been able to produce to world-class standards for South Africa, for Africa, and for the world out of Kabecha, Port Elizabeth. Those are uh, achievements we can all as South Africans be proud of, and it gives me a lot of hope for the future as to how we engage future pandemics and this one, and how we look to revitalize our economy using local capacities. Thanks very much. Yeah, Stavros, you got a round of applause here uh, in, in the room, and I'm sure a lot of people also watching online feeling the same way. I mean, that is a major, major accolade for South Africa. When you think to where we were right in the beginning to where we are right now in terms of the, the, the whole manufacturing process is amazing, but it is about finding that, that secret production that... Uh, when the next panic pandemic comes along, and we've been warned that there is going to be one, whenever it may be, perhaps hopefully not in our lifetime, we need to get over this one first, um, and then we'll worry about it. But at the forefront of, of, of being a part of this vaccine, 
Let's get ourselves an HIV vaccine. How about that? And that'll be what Aspen will be responsible for. I want to bring, um, I'm, I'm very, very um, vigilant of time. And Stavros, I know that you have to go. So I will, you know, I will, I will bring you into that, no doubt. But I want to, of course, bring my other guests that are with us today. And, and like I say, what a panel. They have been introduced. So it's just a matter of, of bringing them into the conversation. And, you know, Ryan, you're here. You've listened to exactly what Stavros has had to say. I mean, and it's absolutely phenomenal to see where we are, but we've still got a very, very long way to go. Now, you, you and I had a very brief chat, you know, offline, talking about how many lives have been lost from Discovery's perspective, whether it be staff, whether it be members. It has been devastating, and we can never, ever forget that. So as much as we're looking forward, we have to pause for a moment to think of those that have been lost to South Africa. Yeah, we, we are unfortunately living through absolutely tragic times. Uh, the South African Medical Research Council's excess deaths report, which really reflects on the baseline of natural deaths in the country and tracks over the COVID period how we've deviated from that baseline. It shows about 250,000 excess deaths through the period in South Africa. Uh, that's devastating. A quarter of a million people each potentially earning a livelihood, supporting a family, part of a network of social structures and community structures. Um, it's a devastating period. At Discovery, we've lost 22 staff members, um, and, and that's 22 too many. Every single one of them leaves a big hole in our system. We've lost 14,000 customers. So it is indeed a tragic time. I think the only response is Stavros's response, which is the correct one. It's to pivot to what are the positives and what are the strengths that can emerge. And from a healthcare perspective, while this has been such a challenging and busy period, it has focused the world's attention on healthcare. And so there's no better time to be in the healthcare system than there is now. Opportunity abounds. We've seen a shift to digital and a pivot towards digital in healthcare, the likes of which we've been waiting for for many years. Our industry has been a laggard in digital uptake, and that's happened very quickly. We've seen solidarity between public sector and private sector counterparts, which, again, many of us who've been in healthcare our whole lifetimes have been waiting for for many years. It's been welcomed by all stakeholders. And the strength that it's created through the vaccine distribution program and the mass vaccination campaign has been simply outstanding. And then we've seen that the South African healthcare system as a country and as a brand, relative to many well-developed healthcare systems around the world, has actually stood up proudly. Uh, our system has coped with this unusual pandemic-related burden, and we have been able to protect and support the population. We've seen how the New York healthcare system fell over and how the Italian healthcare system fell over at the peak of the waves. Yet our healthcare system has coped. It's taken innovation and it's taken cooperation, but indeed we have coped. And for brand South Africa and for South Africa as a country, I think these are the, the legacies that we should take away and build off. Yeah. Uh, Gloria, I know that you are there as well. Let me just see if I've got communication with you properly. Gloria, um, you, you are with us, obviously. Can I hear you? Can Lovely. you hear me? Lovely. We can hear you perfectly. Okay. I'm so glad that okay. you, you, you're there and online with us as well. Gloria, and this is also, Stavros, I'm going to ask you the same, well, very similar question afterwards. Um, what Ryan said is this partnership between um, the private sector and the public sector has been one of the key, key, key moments in our history to have seen where we've gotten to. Because without those partnerships, I don't think we would be anywhere right now. Uh, at one point, South Africans were questioning if we were ever going to get vaccines in arms, if we were ever going to get through this. And they were losing faith at an uh, on an hourly basis, I can tell you that much. But it seems that through these partnerships, the faith was regained and is still getting regained within South Africans. Gloria, begin to explain to us, because that Solidarity Fund was, played a very pivotal role in all of this. The private-public partnership and the lessons learned there. Let me, let me Lee, hand this over to you to talk about. Thank you, Leanne. The, 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 the issue with South Africa is an interesting one, that um, 
take what you want to take from South Africa, but leave something that is real. We have very strong sectors here. And when, after COVID, when everything is done, the countries that are going to be able to stand on their own are the ones with a strong scientific uh, sector and everybody has relied on, on, on their scientists. Uh, in South Africa, we've been privileged to have a very strong scientific, uh, scientist uh, set uh, to rely on. Then the second one is, uh, is one of, we've got a very strong business sector. We can look at every aspect of it. We still have very strong accounting side. We still have strong legal side. So the point I'm coming to Yen is that in the end, what's going to make it work is that these uh, kind of groupings of people are going to stand up for South Africa when it is the most hardest of times and make it work. Uh, we've just released, uh, for example, our annual results. Uh, this morning as a solidarity fund, uh, our uh, audited uh, results. In spite of how much of a rapid response fund and crisis fund and all of those things were to make our decisions standing on our feet, what stands out is that there was no leakage. We've got a strong accounting sector world, price of the house, actually gave it all to make this audit work. But it could work because we were reliant on the strong infrastructure from business for South Africa, of which uh, Stavros is, is one of those. Because that infrastructure makes it work for us. And, and, and what I'm saying here is that in the end, we have a crisis like everyone in the world. Balance is going to be that we've got decent sectors that are going to make sure that there's no leakage, money goes to where it should go. There are systems and governance standards in place to make sure that uh, the right things are actually happening. Because when we come to an investor coming to country A or country B, they're going to rely on how stable your governance structures look like. And uh, South Africa stands out on this and, 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 and makes it work for, for any uh, investors. So um, COVID is going to hit everyone the same way, but COVID is going to kill many places simply because the, the systems are not in place. In South Africa, we do have systems in place. We do have intellectual capacity. We do have our scientists in place. We've got our accounting center in place. We've got our legal structures in place. We can winch all we like. Those things are going to keep us standing. I spent four billion rands uh, with uh, Stavros over a 12 month period. I haven't met him in these 12 months, but we have blown and used four billion rands together on computers like this. And the reason I could do that is because I can trust him. And the reason I could do that is because we are surrounded by systems that will take it out if any funny things do happen around us. So I'm, I'm, I'm just in awe of South Africa in this case, because I think we don't speak about this enough that we have still our systems in place, our professionals, most of our professionals have got pride in themselves. Nobody wants to steal money. Nobody wants to break any system lawyers want to just be lawyers judges just want to be judges and our scientists just want to be scientists even when we have an issue with the uk and this uh, red listing uh, kind of stuff who goes there it is our scientists to battle it out for south africa and that's because we've got the highly highly regarded scientists in the world and 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 for me that is my point that we are going to fall back to how just how well grounded we are. When we remove all the PR around everything, South Africa has got very hard core uh, professionals to fend for it. And COVID has actually shown that. Yeah, yeah. Some, sometimes we think our scientists are too good. 
they scare, they're scaring everyone away from us <laughs> because they're on top of all of these variants. And they're absolutely incredible. They really, really are. Um, yeah. I, I, I am reading the, the, the report that you have just released today, the, 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 the final audited results as to date, how much that Solidarity Fund has actually raised, and revealing that you received 3.4 billion rand in donations from South Africans and dispersed 2.59 billion to three pillars that focus on behavioral change, which is the social cam campaigns on COVID-19, humanitarian relief, and the health response, which of course got the biggest share. So, uh, I mean, this really is something, a, a massive, massive round of applause on that one for the generosity of South Africans and yeah, business. Yeah. <laughs> into, into, into d donating funds into this account. It's amazing. We actually yeah. have the, the Deputy Health Minister with us. I'm going to call, call him up shortly um, because I know he wants to speak to us in a little bit. But before, um, before I call up the Deputy Minister, I just want to get a final word from you, Stavros, because I know that you won't make it through to the end, I think, of the Deputy Minister's um, briefing with us. So on a, on a closing note from Aspen's perspective, uh, we we still have a long way to go. The Johnson & Johnson, of course, that vaccine is something that we, we desperately need in South Africa. We know that the whole issue about exporting and not having it here, we'll get into the UK and the travel restrictions and all of those things. But where, where are we right now when it comes to putting South Africans first? Because that's a lot of the problem that South Africans feel is that we're so worried about everybody around us, but we don't focus enough on ourselves. Yeah. So, Leanne, I think that's, a, that's an excellent question. And I want to build on what Gloria was saying earlier. When we spoke earlier about the lessons that we've learned, and, uh, as with many countries around the world, the, the pandemic's been shrouded in negativity, unfortunately. And you've heard some of the positives, the silver linings today, but I, I really should reinforce what Gloria was saying the public-private collaboration that we've witnessed in the last 18 months is completely unprecedented. In the private sector, you had many organizations, including Ryan's organization, that made available personnel, resources, all on a voluntary pro bono basis without expecting anything back in return. And all we really wanted to do is work together, complement, supplement, support the public sector so that together we could achieve the best outcome for South Africa. And if you have a look at what has been achieved, we don't have time to unpack it. We're very critical of our situation, but I can tell you we faced headwinds that other, other countries did not face. We had a, be a beta variant to deal with by way of example. And I think our ability to swivel and pivot into solution mode has been unprecedented. And the Solidarity Fund for me is a totally unique concept. I wish Gloria would patent it and that's something we should license to the rest of the world. The good thing about being at Aspen is we have a presence in over 60 markets globally. And over the last 18 months, as I've interacted with my colleagues around the world, there has not been a Solidarity Fund concept where the private and public sector have come together for the common public good. It's unprecedented, and I think the rest of the world can learn from South Africa. So let me end off, Leanne, with putting South Africa first. Every one of us in this room has a duty to the national narrative, as we call it. And it's very easy in these difficult times to fall into the negative narrative. And uh, I think what we should take heart from is uh, the positives uh, that manifest out of local solutions that we have found as, as South Africans. Uh, Gloria, Ryan, others, uh, I'm sure the DM and I'm sure my colleague uh, Precious will also reinforce this point. We have significant scientific and technical progress in our country. And that we need to look inwards and say, well, you know, how many other countries uh, have the same capabilities on the continent? There are very few. You would have heard Strive must see you speak earlier. So there's a lot of hope if we also focus on the positives. And I think if there's anything we're going to take away from today's uh, excellent seminar that's been arranged by Brain South Africa is all the positives 
and the things that make us uniquely South African, our diversity, uh, our diversity in unity, our diversity during times of challenge. We need to learn from those, we need to learn from the lessons, and we need to take this forward into shaping a post-COVID uh, economy that is built on sound principles and collaboration across the private and the public sectors, uh, akin to what we've seen in the last 18 months. And, and with those few words, I, I'm going to have to leave uh, Leanne. It's been a great pleasure being part of this panel. And to my esteemed panelists, uh, it's been really good seeing you all again. Thanks very much uh, for having me. Stavros, thanks very, very much. Go well. Make us uh, some more vaccines, if you don't mind. Quickly go. Um, we, we'll let you go for that reason. Uh, Stavros Nikola from Aspen, thank you very, very much for your time. So I've told you we've got the Deputy Minister, but I am not going to introduce the Deputy Minister until I hear Precious's voice. Precious, I want to know from, from what we've heard, who of course is a former DD, uh, DG, as you do know, from the Department of Health. Um, have, you, have you, from what you've been witnessing, ever seen the private and public sector working so closely, especially over this pandemic. And we know that it's almost, you know, um, bad times happen perhaps for a reason and, and we need to learn from them. And perhaps one of the reasons is to see this close collaboration. Has it ever been this close? And what have you made of this public-private partnership that we've seen develop between these two entities? No, th thank you very much, uh, Leanne. Uh, coincidentally, I actually served on the independ independent panel for pandemic preparedness and response, which was led by President Salif and Prime Minister Tlak. And one of the things that we've said to the world is that you need the whole of society response and you need all of government response. So South Africa has been one of the countries in our study looking at 28 countries across the world as to how well did they respond and how well did they do. South Africa was our shining star in the manner in which we've been able to mobilize the whole of society and all of government. Having said that, we actually tend to beat ourselves as South Africa in that the HIV AIDS response in South Africa has also been one area where you had public-private response. And I say so because it would not have been possible in this country to test so many people. In fact, when I came back to South Africa in 2010, after having led the World Health Organization's program on innovation, I was pleasantly surprised that we're going to test 10 million South Africans for HIV. I, 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 I was hesitant. I said, I don't think I'll go back and do this job. 10 million? Hmm. But it happened. But the testing was not done by government alone. It was a partnership. But unfortunately, because we tend to beat ourselves up, and we don't build on our successes. We did not take advantage of that to say, this time around with COVID, how did we do it then? But what is good now is that we've done it even better. Done it in a, even better in bringing about innovative financing. What Stavros referred to about social funding mechanisms that we've seen with Solidarity Fund. Yeah is that it's an innovative financing mechanism. It should not just be for epidemic response. Actually, we should do it for preparedness and we should also do it for research and development for new vaccines. Agree, here, here. Like I say, we do not take a good pandemic like this and let it go to waste. You have to learn from it, and that's what we're hoping we're doing. This is where I introduce the Deputy Minister who has arrived with us. We're very, very happy to have him with us. So the Deputy Minister of Health here in South Africa, Sibongiseni, uh, Dr. Sibongiseni Glomo, joining us today. So let's give him a round of applause. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, Leanne, for that introduction to my fellow 
panelists. Uh, no, I, I was seated there. I could see that there were three chairs on top. So I didn't want to come in and mess up your, your program there. I said, look, I'll wait for my space. <clears throat> no, let me start by saying to all those who have invited us, thank you very much. If you are talking about South Africa, and they are talking about how well we are doing on vaccines for animals, we are doing so well. Why has it taken, even before I want to speak about COVID-19, why have we taken so long to plan to develop vaccines? Two years ago, no, maybe three now, when I was an MEC for Health in Wazul Natal, we had to go to communities apologizing under the leadership of uh, Precious Masoso that we're not able to get immunizations for babies. It's now a norm when a mother delivers a baby in a hospital, they must have a PCG. And you give them a road to health chart that says on month four, you must come back to any near, near, nearby clinic for mumps, measles, rubella, polio, whatever. We were stuck as a country, because we were waiting for India to produce active pharmaceutical ingredients to manufacture PCG. And when COVID comes, we are already a country that depends on any other country to prepare and produce vaccines. So that is my starting point. Come in 10, 20 years again, we have another pandemic in the world. We'll still be waiting. So that's why I had a slight of a difference with the presenter that came much earlier to say, let's focus on now getting vaccines now, now, now. While we are doing that, I appreciate. Why have we not been focusing on producing our own? We are a gateway for Africa. Africa looks up to South Africa. We have the best scientists in this world, in this country. We have CSIR and many other high technology sort of institutions that could actually produce this. So that is where I would have wanted to start, and I know uh, maybe the other processes then will come in. To date, we are very excited that we are announcing that our positivity rate on COVID is sitting at 3.8%. According to WHO, once we are at 5% and below, it means that country, that community is actually in control of that pandemic. We are very excited and we want to push as many vaccines as possible. And the Department of Health, we are going with the slogan VNV, vaccinate and go and vote. You'll be able to go and vote, you'd have vaccinated first. We're pushing the vaccination now so that by the time we get the fourth wave, whether it comes in December, January, we would have at least close to 70% vaccinated our South Africans. Because in that way, we are saying, South Africans, you will still be able to get probably COVID, but it will not be a worse COVID that will take you to the ICU, that will make you die. So maybe, Leanne, let me just leave it at that for my opening to remarks to say, while we are really saying COVID vaccination, vaccination, I'll add more if you want to, because our president has done so well. You know, in, in, this, um, in this continent, only two countries are sitting as to where Italy and others are. It's Seychelles and... Uh, and Mauritius, who have vaccinated at least above 40% of their population. We as South Africa have vaccinated about 30%. The rest of the, of, the, of the continent are sitting at 2%, 5%. But the rest of the world, they've already completed their vaccination. Why? Because somebody prefers that you could send vaccines to Europe and not send them to Africa. So that is the struggle that we are still on. And therefore, the answer to that eventually is when Africa starts producing its own vaccines so that you don't have to actually go back for vaccines. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy Minister. Please, please have a seat with us here uh, on the panel. I really am so glad that you're with us because I, I think this just adds a, 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 a very big dimension into this. So, yes, we are doing well now, but I, w I, want, to, I want to also talk about, you know, some of the other issues. And, and, and let me, um, Ryan, let me come back to you now, because when we look at, when we look at the lessons that we've learned, which is kind of what we're doing here today, is we want to take everything, all the lessons so far, and we're still going through this. We, we're still in the middle of all of this. And as we say, there is another wave coming. We, 
we still got a long way to go with vaccination. 70%, I'm gonna quiz you on that because that sounds very optimistic to me, Dep Deputy Minister, when we're only sitting at 14.3% so far and we are ed heading into October and it seems like we're stalling a little bit. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna come to that now. Okay. But Ryan, what I wanna ask you is medical aid. One of the biggest, biggest issues is medical aid. When you look at South Africa, at the moment, 75% of South Africans are not on medical aid. And the reason they give is because it's too expensive. Help us understand this. How do we run a country and only service such a tiny little bit on medical aid? Yeah, it's, uh, the, the numbers are actually slightly more exaggerated than your number there. Uh, it's about 17%, one seven of South Africans that have private health care insurance today. Um, it's, you're right, it is expensive. <clears throat> the entry price for full medical scheme cover in South Africa now is about a thousand rand. Uh, and you know, people often say to me, why is it so expensive? Why can you not come up with lower cost, more affordable products? Well, medical schemes in South Africa are regulated under the Medical Schemes Act. The Medical Schemes Act as amended in 2006, sets out a set of quite egalitarian criteria which determine how a medical scheme may function. Those include four key principles. And if you understand those four principles, you understand the answer to the question you're asking. The first principle is called community rating. What community rating means is it means anybody who joins a medical scheme in South Africa pays the same price on that particular option. So whether you're young or old, sick or healthy, whether you present with risks to the medical scheme or not, you all pay the same price. So that's principle one. Principle two is open enrollment. Open enrollment means anybody can join at any stage of their life. So you need not be a member of a medical scheme when you're young and healthy and contributing into the risk pools. You can choose to wait outside the medical schemes industry and only join later in life when you're much more likely to need health care at an old age. So that's the second principle, open enrollment. The third is a solvency requirement, which is called a fixed solvency requirement. All medical schemes in South Africa have to, by law, have no less than 25% of their annual contribution income, all the premiums paid by members, 25% held in reserve on day one of the year. So that is a, a legal requirement to, to maintain solvency. And the fourth requirement, and a critically important one, is one called prescribed minimum benefits. These are PMBs, a word that we hear, often hear used. Prescribed minimum benefits is a list of 256 odd conditions which medical schemes have to cover in full from Rand 1 with no co-payments to any of their members. When you put the four together, what you have is you have brilliantly designed legislation that ensures a very robust medical scheme offering for its members. Unbelievably robust. Also egalitarian. The, the downside of these four things in combination is that to price in order to remain compliant on that basis, it is impossible in this market to price below an entry level of about, call it roughly, a thousand rand. Uh, and you know, there are, it swings in roundabouts. It can be 920 or 1,500, uh, 1,050, depending how you price that. But call it roundabouts a thousand rand. What's desperately required in the system is through preserving these solidarity principles and maintaining the spirit of the egalitarian act, coming up with a mechanism to allow low income medical scheme membership that offers a different package of benefits, preserves the principles of social fairness, but makes this more accessible and affordable for a much broader portion of the population. Yeah. There are, my last part of the answer is just to say there are five to eight million people in formal employment, formal employment in South Africa. So that's discounting the informal sector whose employers and who as individuals, research shows, want to belong to medical schemes. But at the thousand rand price, they can't afford it. So there is a conversation about regulatory and legislative change. There have been various task teams over the years. 
In fact, one formed under Dr. Matsotso's leadership when she was the Director General of Health uh, to consider low-income medical scheme products. And uh, we're very optimistic that this conversation ends up in the right place. Well, we, we hope so because it is expensive. I mean, I have a slight heart attack every month. My medical aid, my medical aid goes off. And the reality is, is that I am a part of the you know, the very, very privileged South African can afford to get healthcare because you do get that healthcare. And I remember one of your previous answers is that we handled well during this, co this pandemic. Yes, we may have, but there were also many people who died in chairs, sitting in a public hospital. And Deputy Minister, this is where I bring you in, in public hospitals waiting to get looked at sitting in their own feces for I don't know how long until somebody paid them attention. And these are real, real life stories because they cannot afford what we're talking about, this healthcare. And that's where this imbalance comes in. And this is where the conversation of NHI is the big, big, big glaring point here in this conversation. Where are we? Because I know that it's still got a very, very long way to go. And in between all of that, South Africans are desperate for decent healthcare. I was privileged to remaining, while I was still a chairperson of the portfolio committee, going the whole country, introducing and talking to our citizens about universal health coverage, NHI. And the people were saying, we're listening to you. We thought you were coming in to announce when are we starting. We really wanted so desperate. Uh, you, you are correct that health is a public good. Currently now, where is it, it is sitting? It is sitting at the, in parliament. Uh, I was actually wrapping it up before I was made a deputy minister. And that process has actually got wide consultations. There's about 110 organizations that have actually, Discovery being one of them, that have come to request to make presentations where they want to beef it up or maybe want to add on or subtract certain things in the process. There's a universal acceptance that um, unless and until you go that way, uh, you need to actually make, uh, you, you, you can't win uh, getting people to, re to really receive the, the health. But Leanne, there's a precondition to that, or what I call the enablers. There's a presidential health compact that talks to some of the things that you find uh, currently in hospitals, the inadequate uh, human resource, inadequate medication. People come today, get the medication in two days' time long queues, the attitude of staff, infrastructure, improving posts. If we come into the package of health, uh, universal health care, you would say to, your, to me, city getting Bumbulu, you must first access that primary health facility which is in your clinic. But I must see it beefed up because I would have contributed overall for this fiscal to make a contribution. So there is this uh, expectation because Private institutions are probably at a re relatively good level. The Office of the Health Standard Compliance will have to go countrywide and certify that all those facilities are at a reasonably good uh, level for me to put my money into the fiscals for the universal health funding and yet getting at least the basic care and get referred properly. So that is still work in progress and uh, we are looking into maybe getting it to be, in the, we're in the second phase now, looking into 2026, getting it really across the whole country yeah. ready. Uh, and if you don't mind me jumping in, I, I'm a medical doctor and I am actually a product of the public health care system in South Africa. Okay. Um, it hurts me personally to hear the public health care system getting a bad rap without qualification. And the qualification, which I, I tell you having been on the ground and seen it on the ground, is that there, are, there is still excellence in our public health care system. Yes, there is inconsistency. Um, and you have referred to some of that inconsistency and some of those true stories. Don't deny that at all. But at the same time, just to give balance to the conversation, it's also important to point out we have leading clinicians, well respected across the world. Yes. We have superb medical schools. We have an excellent teaching environment, though we should be teaching more. That's without question. And there are still areas of true excellence, brilliance, in our public health care system. I work in the private sector. I represent the largest administrator of medical schemes in the private sector. If I were sick and I had specific issues, I know of brilliant public sector services where I would personally have no problem going to access care whatsoever. 
So I just want to bring balance to the debate from outside the public sector as a proud product graduate of public sector healthcare in South Africa. But, but, but Ryan, you are fortunate enough to, to have access to the best. You, you, you're amongst the privileged that are able to do that, but so many people are not. And they will stand in those queues, and they will lose their lives by standing in those queues. And as much as we do have the most incredible people working in the public sector, they are leaving the country because they are frustrated. I mean, I, the amount of people that are going because of the frustration, because of the red tape, because of, 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 of the lack of medication, because of the lack of beds, the lack of the capacity, all of these things, hospitals that are not in a state that they should be, and we have got the best of the best in this country, but we're losing them. And this is where the fear comes in. This is the worry. And people are worried about this, and, and, and rightly so. I mean, uh, from your perspective, wh wh how do you feel, Precious? And, and I'm going to open up the floor, so if we can start getting a mic for questions because I know there are many many questions in the audience so I can see one already there but precious let me ask you to, to, to weigh into this conversation well I'd like to weigh into it in that you know having worked in, in the private sector public sector having worked internationally I think there are three things that we need to fix the first thing is that we need to address the regulatory system um, my understanding is that if you over-regulate, you kill innovation. Mm. If you under-regulate, you expose people to harm. Yeah. So it's a balance of how do we get responsive regulation and how do we ensure that it's effective. And, and I'm a strong advocate of regulatory science. You probably saw the debates about the scientists coming up with recommendations, saying some of the recommendations have not been taken up or not. Yeah. It's actually what drives innovation. So when we have a, a, you know, a, 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 a network of scientists in the country that can guide where the country should go, government should come to the party. It is not to kill this country. Those scientists are South Africans. Yes. And that is the first step. The second one is that, you know, when I looked at the WHO figures on the ratios of um, doctors, nurses, midwives per 100,000 population, the sustainable development goal is that by 2030 we should have 45 per 100,000 population. South Africa is already at 60, combined nurses, at doctors and midwives. The difference is that South Africa's human resource for health problem is the distribution between public and private, is the distribution between rural and urban. So you have to get the distribution right. And you are right, I mean, the, the anxiety among scientists, specialists, and our specialist number per 100,000 population is a concern. Mm. We should still invest in our specialists. Even if we are advocating for primary health care, we still need those specialists. Very much. We still need them, and I agree. So the, a, pro, a, a, a good regulatory environment is good to stimulate innovation. And for Brand South Africa, we probably need to start branding that as well to say South Africa has a good regulatory environment for growth, for innovation. Yeah, Thank gr you. Great, great comments there, um, Precious, on that one. The EVDS system, wasn't that a great lesson learned? Um, Deputy Minister, Ryan, also if you want to add in. Gloria, do we still have you there? I hope we do. Um, but this EVDS system, one of the biggest problems, and I think what perhaps slowed us down slightly in the beginning of, of the, the pandemic and trying to, to reach South Africans was the fact that there isn't a centralized database yes. that is available. And where, wherever you are in the country, we've got nine provinces trying to, to do something like this and try and find patients and South Africans way over the place. This must be one lesson learned that needs to be carried forward. I mean, how do, we, how do we build on this? Because we've started, it's there. How are you as the department building on this centralized system that we, we need here in this country? 
the, 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 the lessons are not that far to learn from. Uh, in my other previous life, I'm a, a, a general in the army. Wh when you have a soldier in Palabora going to a, a sick bay for medication, and that soldier the next day is in Cape Town, they will just press a button and notice that this soldier was seen in the sick bay in Palabora, so including their families. So it's not, you're, you're not asking for something that is very uh, difficult. Right now, as I know, we started from the clinic, so we have entered at least about 40, 40 million, I learned. 40 million of our South Africans now are at the database of that clinic, this clinic, that clinic. But yet, we don't have yet a link to clinic number A and clinic number B. So I might still go to clinic number A and go to Paraguanat Hospital and still be seen as a new person because there's no link as yet. But we are correct. This COVID-19 and the way of managing data and EVDS is actually showing that we must probably accelerate the system and go that way. Yeah, that's an important, it's a very, very important thing. Yeah. I mean, Ryan, your idea of this, this centralized system, which many people have emphasized as this is, is a vitally important thing for the country. Uh, you know, our, country, our company is founded on the belief that data and data insights and analytics are at the heart of innovation, product development, customer value proposition. And that's become even more relevant now in, in the 21st century with this fourth industrial revolution, to coin a term. The, the journey that the deputy minister descri describes for a soldier with a centralized clinical record, that's true too for all 3.7 million administered lives at Discovery Health. Uh, we've invested hundreds of millions to build a centralized clinical system. It's a, it's a challenge that many countries around the world have grappled with for years. And even in very rich, well-developed healthcare systems, they still haven't got the interconnectedness uh, right. The interoperability between systems has become almost more of a cost in the US than the primary systems themselves. So, uh, you, you know, to, to put that in non-technical speak, connecting the systems and sharing the data between them has become more expensive than running the actual systems themselves now, just that connectedness. It's because clinical care is complex. It's coded, there's an ontology, there's a structure around it, and we, we really are working very hard to try and ensure that we can come up with a standard across the country that's uniform and consistent. I think to pick up on, on your point, Leanne, I think it's a very good point. EVDS has been incredibly successful. Um, and, and, and kudos to the Department of Health for that. Uh, there were teething problems initially, and yeah. that's to be expected with every new system. Uh, but we overcame those quickly, and it has facilitated one of the most efficient rollouts of vaccination to the country that any country has seen. We were late to start, uh, and that's because procurement was a particular challenge in our environment. In the end, we got good deals and good supply. Once supply started to flow, our government-led uh, mass vaccination campaign has been awesome, incredibly yeah. efficient, with EVDS underpinning it um, at the center of the data. Our vision is to try and create an environment where that data sharing between trusted sources is bilateral. Um, you know, to, to the future of EVDS, in our view, should be an ability to access a clinical record for a patient anywhere in a healthcare system, private, public, anywhere, as long as that consent is there and the protection of information is adequate, with those provisions, make that record available so that clinical care can be improved. Absolutely, and, and I mean, the one thing that was really quite clear is that countries around the world that do have this system, their response and reaction was much quicker, and, and that's something I do hope that going forward we'll learn lessons from. This vaccination thing, Deputy Minister, 70% by the end of the year, how are we going to do this? Uh, look, we are pushed by the instruction from the president to say, I would like you to vaccinate about 300,000 people by every day. Yeah. 300,000. So we then had the mathematical uh, modeling from some scientists and who told us how to do this. And uh, we are therefore saying, look, the adult population in the country is 18 years, 18 years and above is about is 40, 40 million South Africans. And they would like to get to 70% of those vaccinated. We are the maximum, the best we've ever done in one day was 275,000 per day. 
right now we are hovering at about 230 to 250 per day but if you look into that it translates to 1 million vaccinations per week now you counting how many weeks we have before the end of this year we probably may not get there but would have pushed significantly if we really push that is why this weekend there's another very important program every deputy minister minister councillor premier MECs are out there to vaccinate people in this mathematical model, we can tell how then you are doing relatively well in this area and that area. There are pockets of excellences within each province. There are districts we know are not doing well. That is why under the leadership of the Deputy President, we go as an interministerial committee to, to go and visit specific districts and check what are the areas, why are people not doing well. There are, of course, uh, we get responses, there's a hesitancy of vaccine among our people. But there's this issue and about people say, oh no, I thought I was going to do it next week. I'm not rushing. I know there's enough vaccines. And so really, we are really still appealing to South Africans. We just have enough vaccines. We are short of arms. Yeah, we need the arms. Mm -hmm. Compulsory vaccination. Yeah. I don't know why I'm looking at you, Ryan. My <laughs> eyes are just staring at you. <laughs> you know Discovery. They pulled in that compulsory yeah. vaccination drive. It's going well? Yes, look, this was a, a decision that took a long time and a lot of debate and very careful consideration to reach. Um, when, when we've lost 22 staff, 14,000 customers, 250,000 South Africans, and we have tools at our disposal to mitigate that, we ultimately concluded, taking mutual respect into account, that we really have no choice but to live by our own philosophy, which is that we must enhance and protect the lives of our customers and our very own people. We are desperate to get our people back into our offices. I've mm -hmm. been working at home for two years. <laughs> uh, this is now. the very first in-person event I've attended in two years. Yeah. Uh, and we are determined to get our people safely back into the office. If we are to do so, and restore a sense of belonging and connectedness, we must do so with safety. And the safest way is not only masking and social distancing and hygiene precautions and temperature scanning, all of that, and vaccination. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we, we understand there are diverse views, and on an individual basis, person by person, we will work as hard as we need to to uh, convince people individually and to show respect for their views. Okay, Deputy Minister. Are we, as South Africans, eventually going to get, a point, get to a point where it is compulsory to vaccinate? <coughs> uh, that matter has come up in government. Uh, I can say this, Leon, if I were to invite you to my Christmas lunch, uh, I, will, I will ask you to bring your vaccination certificate. Then we can sit on the table and enjoy. But uh, if we don't, we'll sit in the Kate and now we have your lunch there. <laughs> no, we are not making it compulsory for government, but uh, we understand and there's a pressure out there. We think we should rather make it push for incentives. Mm. We have been approached as government by sports loving people, administrators to say there's a match coming between I think South Africa and another country very soon. We would like to open up and say people come to the same. We people look at the Euro 2020, they look at the US Open tennis and everywhere where citizens of those countries are going in there enjoying what they see. Now, if there is a pressure from SAFA or people to say you can only come to the stadium if you were to produce your certificate, we will not be opposed to that, but we are not pushing that people must get it is mandatory, but we are encouraging and throwing yeah. in. Uh, incentives the st the us and culture people are coming in to say we want to open up when they have more Indeed. said please encourage right now the, the 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 churches those that have got big auditorium as big as this one where they can have uh, about six thousand people said we want to have half of at least the auditorium now we are not yet here as government to give them the whole three thousand but if they show in that particular church that particular community that they've all vaccinated will encourage them to say, wear your mask, come to this, but maybe, we, so we are getting there, but so we, We're still in the encouragement phase. We need, we need something better than a wimpy coffee. I mean, come on. Those are the incentives that we've got here in South Africa. You know you can get a free wimpy coffee if you've got a vaccine. Deputy Minister. 
There's better coffee out there. Sorry, Wimpy. <laughs> <laughs> America, they're offering us. A, they're offering this. It is a hundred dollars per vaccine. Come on. Yeah. We got to find. We we got to find good incentives before we start making it mandatory. We will definitely come if you give us suggestions, Leanne. With more incentive, we will do so. But none of them will be monetary. Okay. None. Yes. Precious, how do you feel about all of this? Um, I mean, we're speaking to. It, I love having you next to me because you know we've got the the, the guys sitting over there. Yeah. We put them on the spot, and then I come to you and I say, mm -hmm. "We've got to wrap up." And I'm sorry that we haven't yes. got to questions because I know the questions are they there, but we just we really haven't had a chance to get to to questions during this panel. Mm -hmm. But I mean, through these things and what's been said, from whether it's mandatory vaccinations or getting to those goals, how do you feel about this? Well, firstly. I would like to say that we, we could learn from the polio experience. We said we were going to kick polio out of Africa. And at the time, there were countries where you could not even come anywhere near certain communities because of anti-vaxxers, because of vaccine hesitancy, but also because the communities themselves were informed that it was not a good idea to be vaccinated for polio. Africa today is polio free, and we have very, very impressive results in this continent. How did that happen? It's because we started with communities. We did not need a billboard for that. It was communities on the ground, educating themselves, engaging, interacting. By the time the billboards came, it was a fait accompli, yeah. and it was easier to reach out. We used community leaders, church leaders, because those leaders are just as important as other role players in every sector of society. So our polio experience can be the same experience that we use when we prepare for the next pandemic, but also for this one. I still have hope, and I know that, Deputy Minister, it can be done. You've done it before with Operation Sugumasake. Operation Sugumasake was a community mobilization initiative where a mayor could tell you that in my community, how many people have been tested for HIV? How many people are on antiretroviral therapy? So, so I guess we can still go back and bring communities on board and ensure that they can be partners in this initiative. Love it. Let's wrap this up. So in 30 seconds, and I know it's a, a little amount of time, but I think we've, we've done quite well in covering as much as we possibly can. I love the hashtag behind me, and I hope I have a beautiful photograph of it. Hashtag believe in South Africa. Every one of us sitting here believes in South Africa. That goes without saying. We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be fighting for this country the way we are. Because that, that's what it takes. It takes people with a lot of courage, with a lot to say, with a lot of insights. But more importantly, it takes a to-do attitude, to get out there and actually get your hands dirty. Mm -hmm. From the health perspective, let's wrap it up. And, and Precious, I'll begin with you. What are your closing comments? What what is that most important thing you want to see this country do from a health perspective to make South Africans hashtag believe in SA again? On two fronts, at a global level, South Africa, hashtag believe in South Africa still exists. The global health community still believes in this country, its scientists, its people. And I think we need to build on that. And we need to use that as advocacy. On the ground level, we need to go back and use our communities as part of that response. Let them not be left behind. Ryan? I would like to see nothing more than this public-private experience that we've had during COVID becoming a constructive conversation to jointly architect a brilliant healthcare future for the country. And I am optimistic and believe that's feasible of the successes of what we've seen in COVID. Indeed. And then finally, Deputy Minister. Yeah. The, the private-public partnership we have had over the past two years in this country is unparalleled. We have never seen it before. We can only ask for it to be even much more strengthened. Also, in, there's a cohort 
of experienced, very good scientists, world-renowned scientists in the country. So really, for us to be able to say, believe in, uh, in South Africa, is just at our doorstep. We, we could do more with the resources that we already have. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Minister. And by the way, set that table, because I'm sitting at the table. <laughs> I'm double vaccinated. Christmas lunch at your house. I'll be there. But I got a big family. I'm bringing them all with as well. <laughs> Thank you so much to my panelists. Gloria, who I know is with us. I'm sure we, we, uh, we, we I didn't get to thank her, but thank you so much for your time. Stavros as well. And to all of you for watching this one and to everyone in the room. Thank you very, very much for that. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much to our panel. And it's always good to hear and see public-private partnerships as you were speaking about playing out for the good of South Africa. Thank you all so much for your time this afternoon.